What's up? I'm Dan Fradenberg, and this is another Chance Encounter. Hey, what's up? I'm Dan Fradenberg. I'm a commercial real estate guy. I'm from the internet. We're seeing uh, we're seeing more properties like this being built in front of a house. It's going to be torn down soon. I understand that there are power lines that are just kind of close. What's up again? This is Dan Fradenberg, and that there is a commercial real estate building. I've been waiting for this one for a while. Emma Powell is here with me today. How are you doing today, Emma? Hey, good to talk to you. It's been a while, but we've been trying to get this on the calendar, so. Right, right. You got lots of stuff going on, but let's talk to my favorite audience member for a moment first. These, this is a commercial real estate investor interview series called Chance Encounter. I interview the commercial investors because we kind of have to because of the law. But the other big thing is we need to know, okay, so why are you doing this? What's your core competency that you're looking to contribute in your next deal? And the way I do that is I go through the five distinct motivations that I found commercial investors have. And then I pull out the dandoesdeals.com commercial roll die with the six different roles in a commercial deal, which you can get at dandoesdeals.com for free. You can just download it, print it out. You can show your parents, your friends, your aunt, your uncle. And the most important thing is you can communicate effectively on the topic of commercial real estate. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves, Emma, can you introduce yourself to the audience real quick? Yeah, I am the owner operator of High Rise Group. We syndicate uh, multifamily deals. And after um, kind of a rough a rough 2021, we repositioned to running a multifamily or commercial real estate investing club where we get together and we pool our capital to invest in other operators deals, which is a little bit more passive, but not completely limited partner. Um, and then we are able to kind of be on like a board position in the, in the co-GP where we can kind of keep an eye on things and protect um, our investment that we put in there. So, um, and then, you know, I usually raise a little bit of LP money on the side as, as a member of the GP. So it's a great way to get into your first commercial deal with a much lower barrier of entry. So we just closed our first deal at the end of January and uh, we're working on our second one right now. Beautiful. So let's do the motivation piece. So I hit this and then I hit that and then I hit that and then of course it doesn't pop up because I'm on a time crunch so I hit this and then I hit that and then it comes up and then we're good to go so the five different motivations first one is preserving purchasing power so people who rely on the cash flow from their assets their biggest concern is inflation and the cure is to make more acquisitions so a lot of people make more commercial acquisitions because they're more concerned about that and that's not my big motivation my big motivation is trading time for wealth rather than salary or wage because salary and wage you get the income tax that's about half once you start doing well my background is in tech crm specifically so that's mass marketing and keeping track of your contacts. And I was thinking, well, how can I pivot and use my skills where I'm getting equity instead of salary? And then that way I get to keep more of it. So that's what I'm up to. The next reason though is the most frequently chosen one is fast tracking retirement, which is also a code word for controlling your calendar, reducing the number of hours that you work per week, reducing the hour, the number of weeks per month, the number of months per year, whatever it is, or actual retirement. The main thing is it's slowing down and not having to be so hectic any longer. Whereas mm -hmm. the next two, they don't really care about hectic. The first time, the first type, they are so ambitious. They want to buy their entire hometown and they're thinking about generational wealth. They're th want, they want to make sure that their great grandchildren never have to hold a day job. So they're great people to have around as well. But the last group, they've picked some sector of society or the environment or animals or something, and they want to make a big impact. And they realize that having the financial background, the wealth, it really is the most important part to make that huge impact. So those are the five motivations I've found. Uh, Emma, what of those uh, resonate most for you? Um, well, I have a question on the first one, preserve purchasing power. I don't think I've ever really 
thought about put it that. phrased that yeah. way yeah yeah yeah, so, yeah well the main thing is that if you do rely on the cash flow of your assets then when inflation comes along it's you know you're gonna you don't want to actually liquidate any of your assets to make yeah. ends meet so you have to end up making more acquisitions it's basically a well somebody on the wealthier side or a family office that's yeah. that's really what their play is is making sure they have enough assets to uh, sustain their lifestyle for the for the near future I wonder I wonder maybe a little bit of that I mean, definitely fast tracking retirement was our original goal we have a large family of six kids and my husband uh, works at a w2 and while he's super flexible because he's in the tech industry so he's a knowledge worker so he's hundred percent remote he can be hundred percent remote anywhere in the country um, can't live abroad but we can go anywhere we want in inside the, the United States um, I feel like people are like oh you really want to retire what are you gonna do afterwards and I was like well I have six kids I'm sure I'll find something to, <laughs> to keep me busy but um, I would say helping people would be number two, but it's mostly, you know, like my family and, and creating good citizens who, and also some of the people that I work with, like former athletes and, and people like that, who I can train and then they can go out and, and do philanthropy. And I feel like I have a, a piece of that um, by training people how to go do it. So I, I get to be able to say, oh yes, I participate in this, this, and this, because the person who became wealthy and started that nonprofit um, we work together. So for me, it's more of an indirect helping people. I probably can help people more directly, uh, maybe as my kids get a little older and they can participate in it. But I'd say fast tracking retirement is number one. Um, mm -hmm. But isn't that, isn't that kind of like preserving purchasing power? Because I need to make sure we have enough passive income coming in and we have enough assets that can support us uh, for our lifestyle. So that maybe that Maybe that's similar to retiring early. Uh, yeah, it definitely is. I like to uh, I like to point out that if you aren't focusing on wealth to a large degree, I don't even think you're leaving the door open for retirement. And uh, but as far as uh, preserving purchasing power, one of the biggest ones is it means that you probably don't have a day job. You probably mm -hmm. don't have you know like because you're relying on your wealth. But let's go on to the different roles. So we'll get your core competency out here. I'm going to be a little bit terse today. So yeah, sorry yeah, about that. You can kids, check out other ones. Yeah, kids. See, out exactly. <laughs> exactly. So let's talk about what a repositioner is. That's a person who looks at a whole whack of different properties. They're underwriting it. That's a fancy word for doing the math. They're making sure that the business is already making the amount that they say the seller says it is. And they're looking for ways to make changes and make more money, some upside. First one is operations. You can do more efficient operations, fewer Benjamins going down the toilet. And uh, that way you are increasing the value of the building and also the net operating income because your expenses have dropped. But that's usually not enough these days for repositioners. So often they have to get a contractor team so that they are renovating, they're doing a value add, and then that way they can charge more in their rent. But while that's going on, if you're like me and you're from the internet, then you need to make sure that these people are actually doing their jobs. So you need boots on the ground, you need a local because I don't wanna have to get my passport and fly out there myself. And they're going to be the accountability piece. They're making sure that they're not cutting corners on the on the rehab and the operations are doing what they're supposed to. Now, the other way you can get upside is by getting better lending, by going to the financiers, the different people who deal just in money, like uh, capital raisers, mortgage brokers, whatever. But if you tell the financier, okay, yeah, here's the property, here's the local, here's the operations, here's the contractor team and the contract, they're still going to want to know more. They're going to want to know who's your sponsor, who's your KP. And it doesn't matter how much money you have, if you want to pick up, let's say a 350 unit apartment complex. If you want to get a loan, which everybody does, you're going to have to have somebody in the fold who already owns a similar asset. Okay. And also they'll have to have a certain amount of liquidity. And then between the GP team, you're going to have to have a balance sheet of at least the amount of the loan. But if you have all those pieces, you've got yourself a commercial real estate deal. So Emma, as far as your uh, core competencies, it sounded like, um, you have some finan uh, financier parts and it sounds like that's a little bit like a, a fund that you've got put together with that group, but uh, I'm not sure what the, uh, the legal side is, but what are, what do you usually bring to your deals? Um, I think I started out more as like a, an operator um, because I think that's where a lot of people 
have to start out, but I'm not very detail oriented. And so I would say my strength is actually being more of a generalist where mm -hmm. I know a lot about all of those things, but I'm not really a specialist in any one of them. So I'm, I'm more the person who can kind of bring people together and be the glue or the grease or however you want to explain it and just make sure that we have all those components in place, either from my network or from the team itself. Um, and I, I think that as I'm moving to get more and more passive, the, the step before just becoming a limited partner um, would be the more passive parts of that, which is the financier raising capital um, and also um, being able to sign on loans. And so trying to find the right size deal if I'm the only KP, but you can stack up KPs. Like for example, I have agency debt experience, so I could sign on a loan for the agency, but you might need somebody with a bigger balance sheet or more liquidity than I have because it's a it's a massive deal. So um, we can we can definitely team up an effort on those. So definitely the more passive of those is what I'm moving towards for that early retirement. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And then as far as the ideal property, just just so you know, uh, when investors are talking to each other and say, hey, what's your ideal property? What's your buy box? Something like that. They're really looking for three things. They want to know the geography. So what state, what county, what parts of the cities? Uh, where are the properties that you really want? The second one is the unit counts. Okay. It doesn't matter what kind of commercial uh, com commercial property it is, except for uh, industrial. There's always a unit count involved. If it's industrial, it's probably more uh, square footage. Square footage uh, yeah. but, right. And then the third one is the class, which they have two, they use class for two different things. One is the area it's in as far as the schools, like how, how good are they? How close are they? The crime rate and stuff like that. But then there's also the condition of the building. Okay. And for both of them, they, it's the same as grade school, you know, B, B plus, A minus and so on. So uh, Emma, what is easier for you to say yes to and more difficult for you to say no to? As far as the, the my ideal deal, right. um, I'm, I'm having a tough time shifting over from high return, uh, heavy value add deals because I have a construction management um, experience and I really love all of that. Um, repositioning, making a big difference for the people who live there and, and it gets high returns. And now that we're trying to retire, we're becoming more of that coupon clipper looking for cash flowing deals. So it might be a 10% or 11% cash and cash return, but it's like a 13% total return. It's basically a cash flow deal, which I say I want. But then when I look at the total returns, I'm like, oh man, I, I can do so much better than this. So it's been a little bit of a difficult transition from building equity and building net worth to converting that to cash flow. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'll emphasize that's for Emma's self. She's talking about herself, nobody else. <laughs> and I'll tell you why I mentioned that is because my next question is who is it out there that uh, you're best suited to help? Me personally, because of my marketing and tech and all that kind of stuff background, I'm better suited to help sponsors and KPs because they've already got some systems in place and mm -hmm. I'm the kind of person who fixes them up and automates them through programming. But uh, I mentioned that you were talking about yourself because of the SEC rules, which is that you can't entice investors unless you got a 506C raise. Mm -hmm. So uh, Emma, as far as the person in commercial real estate who you're best suited to help, uh, can you describe them? Um, I seem to have the best rapport with really motivated and decisive beginners because the club that we do, we meet every week and we put deals on the cutting room floor and we just look at them. Do we want to invest in this deal or not? Um, it's a pool. Like I said, we pool our own capital. So we really have to look at these things really in depth, but it's people who've been trying to get into their first deal for a while and are frustrated because it goes from zero to a thousand in one deal. Um, where we are able to partner up with operators who bring us good deals, who have all of those pieces in place, and all we're doing is pooling our own capital as a club to go in. And then because we're able to negotiate a little bit of co-GP to protect that pooled investment, um, we're getting uh, back, back office access to asset management systems, things like that. I'm just learning a lot. So if they want to go off and sponsor their own deal or raise capital, they are well equipped to do that. If we just want to keep doing it as a club, for me, that's about the speed that I want to be going right now. Um, or if we just end up being like, ah, you know, I learned a lot. I'm just going to LP. So for those motivated and decisive beginners, we have a lot of opportunities. Um, but we also attract some more experienced people who are looking to take a step back. And we also attract like fund managers who are looking for more deal flow, more deal opportunities. But I would say that the motivated, decisive beginners is, is really who I connect best, best with. All right. Beautiful. And the way to reach out to you, uh, I know that we met through some meetups. I'm always on LinkedIn. Uh, is there a website or is LinkedIn best or, or what's the best way to get? 
Um, probably the best way is my website. It's www.highrise.group. And if you go to slash contact, I have all my social links on there. You can book a call, free call on my calendar. Like I said, the club is always free. And if uh, you go to uh, the site where, uh, part of the site where you can either join the club or just join the list as a passive investor if you just want to hear about uh, when we're doing a deal, if you want to go in as a limited partner um, and just either establish that relationship for a 506B or, you know, if you want to just, if you're accredited and just want to see our, our uh, public deals. So that's the best way to get a hold of me, but then it has the portals out to all my other stuff my social stuff all right awesome and i only have one more thing and it's actually not for you it's for yeah. you in the camera i want to draw your attention below my left hand uh, if you're on a phone the, there's it's only just a red word but on desktop it's this terrible red button it's so ugly like I, every time i'm like blah and the only way to get rid of that terrible red button is by clicking on it because it turns it gray and the gray buttons are way better than red buttons because it means that youtube pays for these videos instead of me so if you could do me a really big favor and hit that it costs you absolutely nothing it just means that these videos might show up on your list of suggestions but you don't even have to watch those because you've already done me an enormous favor just like emma you've done me an enormous favor by joining me today this has been great yeah likewise we're all here networking to help each other grow each other's businesses it's definitely a team sport so thanks for having me on and, and giving me a little bit of a platform and help you out and help me out my pleasure all right awesome thanks Hey, thanks for watching today. I want to say a quick word about 506BME. You may know that these interviews are how I document my investor relationships for 506B compliance. Basically, you need to know the person that you're working with enough that you know their level of sophistication at the very, very minimum. And that's exactly what we're doing. If you're a commercial investor and you've ever put any thought into what would happen if somebody says they were publicly solicited and you don't have the proper documentation, maybe it's something you didn't think of. I'm the kind of person who does think of that because I used to work for a CRM company. So I was sitting there saying, okay, well, how do you tag people? What kind of forms do you write? What kind of things do you make them accept? And then what do you end up showing people? Sure, it's in the old noodle, but really what you need is a third party verification service. But the problem is who can you trust with your list? That's something that I know from working for web.com back in the day. But anyway, I set up 506BME so that if you're, if you're at a live event, you just pull out your phone, it's got the QR code, they pull out their phone, they scan it, boom, and you're added to their watch list. So that when they get back to the hotel room or they get back home, they know everybody who they have to check out in these little punchy 15 minute interviews. Anyway, if you are a commercial investor or even if you're thinking about it, do 506B me after this. Thanks. Enjoy this episode.